You folks asked for it. Here's the masterclass for knockout offensive in Mythic Plus. And if you folks don't know, you start off the key by being able to fly off to the different bosses. You can do it in whatever order you want. It just so happens in this key, I don't want to waste your time at the start with the RP and whatnot. We decided to head to the Storm boss first. And you can see this is a 16 plus Tyrannical that we timed on the second week in the park. But I'm going to explain every single zone, every single boss, every single mechanic play by play so you have the confidence to crush this keystone in Mythic Plus. And I'll explain it from both Fortified and Tyrannical's perspective in terms of affixes. So as I earlier mentioned, we started off by heading towards the Storm boss first because let's face it, on Tyrannical keys, you know, Pucks are just anxious to see whether you can do the Storm boss or not. And if you can, well, you probably have a good chance of timing this key. So I pulled the pack on the waterfall. It really doesn't matter which pack you do, right? Like you need to kill all the packs with the totems. I'm sure you know that by now already. But if you're new here, you're gonna kill the totems. Um, there's basically um, like four different packs of mobs that you need to kill uh, with the totems in order to free the boss. The most important thing in this um, entire area here, the most important thing they need to know is the Storm Speaker is arguably the most dangerous custom mob that you need to kick. It will cast something called Tempest that absolutely must be interrupted. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for that. The other thing that I would say you need to kick here is basically the mini boss, which is known as Zari, right? And the Totem is also another dangerous, um, you know, DPS kind of target that you should sit on. But on Fortified Weeks, I can tell you all these packs are super dangerous because of all the cast and magical damage that is essentially going off um, on all these people. So what you should also take note of as a melee is that these arc blades, they cast a frontal, well not a frontal, but they do a cleave on the tank. And uh, maybe when we head to the next pack, I'll explain it a bit better. But on Fortify, I can tell you these packs are dangerous. You need to be very careful here. Kick as much as you can. And um, those little tiny elementals, they don't do much, right? They have zero health, but they have a shield on them. You just need to break the shield and they die. This mob here is dangerous, right? Like a lot of people, like they, they think this is harmless. The Thunder Beast, this Thunder Strike, it frags on Fortified. You need a kick rotation on this. Um, other than that, the Thunder Beast has a few tricks up its sleeves. One of them is basically this Chain Lightning. You can see it's been cast on the Rogue here. The moment you have Chain Lightning on you, you need to run out from the party because if you don't what happens is basically you chain you know damage across the party the rope basically vanished here and that's why uh you know the cast didn't go through and the boss oh sorry this thunder beast also does something called a thunder clap and you can see that it's this very faint blue circle that is in the water again very dangerous because sometimes you tank it in the water, you can't see the swirlies and you die. People will die because of this in one shot of fortified. You can see Chain Lightning going off again on my rope. And he literally is in melee range. Remember, this is a tyrannical key, right? So watch the damage profile going out on me, the DH, the rope, the chamois. Because we are all literally in close proximity of one another. This Chain Lightning, in fact, you see here, that's a lot of damage. So you need to be very careful here. On fortified keys, this will basically wipe you. So Thunder Beast, nothing to be scoffed at. Make sure you have a rotation, run out on Chain Lightning. Sometimes the Chain Lightning also jumps on your range. So if your range is stacked up for some reason in Narnia, then um, they might get one shot too. So be very careful about that. The next thing that um, I'm basically doing is I'm pulling, again, the second pack of totems here. And you can see that there's a certain pattern to these mobs, right? On Fortified Keys, you are always going to get a Storm Speaker in this pack followed by some form of mini boss that has its own unique name, in this case, Solongo. And you can see I kicked the Tempest there because that's the important kick that I need to make. Um, and after which the DPS then, you know, proceeds to kind of, you know, uh, hit the, the totems. So you can also see like, um, there's this like electrical uh, ground effect here. When I walk on it, it you actually take damage. And on fortified keys, that's obviously a big no-no, right? But again, most important thing, kick. Tempest cast, the Storm Speaker, that's number one priority, then kick the mini boss. So be very wary about, you know, contributing to your party in terms of interrupts. Uh, I would say AoE stuns work fantastic on these guys, right? Like AoE stuns, fear, disorient, like those are ways you can stop the damage from coming out onto the party. And it's something that you should do. So 
you can also see like they spawn orbs, right? Like these orbs are very similar to what the boss does later. You can pick up those orbs and it gives you um, a slight DPS buff um, and some bolstering of your true put here. But same thing here, you can notice that they all do the same, except this arc blade, this arcing strike. What it does is it hits the tank. And if there's a six yard, you know, a person within six yards of the tank, they take cleave damage basically. And you can see it on the tyrannical key doesn't really do that much damage. It's a little thing to take note of. I think it's six yard, but um, as a melee DPS, all I'm trying to tell you is you want to stand um, behind the mob, right? Don't stand in front of the mob like your tank. Uh, meaning be far away, hit the mobs from max melee range. But so far, the arc blades haven't been a huge problem even on fortified keys. Uh, this is probably the easier pack because you realize it doesn't have a storm speaker for you to kick. It only has like Boru, the dude that you need to interrupt. That's it. Um, and then we are gearing up to fight the storm boss. So I'm sure a lot of you have encountered the storm boss already, right? This is not an easy boss especially on tyrannical keys. This is also known as the breaker of keys. And there's a few tips and tricks here that I'll cover here. And I'll also talk through the most important thing and how um, you know, we did this in a park on a 16 tyrannical on week two, where we don't have that much gear yet. So you can see I'm basically waiting for the druid to drink to full health, um, or to full mana, right? So I'm basically telling him like, you know, I'm waiting for him and he will let me know uh, you know, as you can see on the top right here, he's at 55% ma mana, right? So I'm waiting for him to get 100 before I pull. And the most important thing about this boss is positioning, I would say. The idea here is that you want to keep uh, the boss from gaining any orbs, right? That that basically makes um, him hit a lot, a lot harder. You can see like the boss is essentially buff right now. Um, and this is when like he does the most damage, right? Okay, so this effect, this blue swirlies, what does it mean? It means that when your debuff times out, you are going to explode any orbs that is within your circle and it will pulse electricity on the ground that you need to dodge. This is one way to destroy the orbs and prevent the orbs from getting to the boss. As you guys can see, the orbs are destroyed. The alternative obviously is, as you guys can see, is to basically pick up the orbs. When you pick up the orbs, you get a stacking buff um, of basically healing and DPS. Each stack gives you 5%, and this can stack up to 10 stacks maximum. So what's the strategy here? On a tyrannical key, I would say the priority actually goes to the healer. You can see the healer only has four stacks right now, very faint, but you guys can see it. And I'm trying to play goalie, right? I don't want to let the boss pick um, the ops up. Something that you should know is that this electrical storm AoE is pulsing AoE unavoidable damage and it trucks on Tyrannical. If your healer doesn't have 10 stacks, he's gonna struggle unless he pops a cooldown. But what you've noticed here is that the party also started popping defensives. You can see on the left here, right? Started popping defensives and that's because like this um, intermission actually uh, does a lot of damage. And you can see the Druid popping bug here. Um, and he also put an external buck on someone, which I'm not sure who, but he put it on someone. And you can see the druid is also being smart about the way he used orbs. He had seven stacks going into the final uh, healing phase. You can see I also did something where I'm baiting windburst. As a tank, you will get trucked when you are moving out of melee range and you're holding threat on the boss. He basically casts this magical cast on you called windburst. Uh, for tanks who are weak against magical damage, right? And I'm talking about like brewmasters, bears, they are very susceptible to magical damage, this thing trucks them. As a prop warrior, you do it on purpose because you can actually reflect the cast. You can see spell reflects up. I'm actually going to reflect. You can see uh, currently at 2.11 million, this thing was spiked shortly, right? You can see 2.16, 2 right? That is essentially the reflect damage on the boss uh, of Windburst. And you basically can use it to kind of like speed up the process a little. And I covered this in my one minute tip guide on this uh, channel. But again, the, the idea of this place is to play goalie, right? Um, and to prevent ops from getting the boss. Look at what the druid is doing. The druid is literally, literally trying to get the 10 stacks here. And he wants to maintain this 10 stacks of um, buff because on the next electrical storm, he needs to make sure he has the sufficient throughput to heal the boss. 
And as a tank, I can say like, you want to make sure you cycle your defensives. Help the healer out. The healer is super stressed at this point. And he is just making it a habit to capture all the ops before it hits into the electrical storm, which is right now. You can see the druid literally refresh his stack. Right, he ran out. You can see he literally ran out earlier. He tranked. The first thing he did was tranquility. And even with tranquility at 10 stacks, 50% more healing, this boss is absolutely decimating us. So a few things we could have done, right? The Demon Hunter obviously had darkness and the rogue has killed, but they're obviously saving it for, I guess, like a very old shit scenario. I, on the other hand, was just spamming Ignore Pain. And you can see me baiting the Wind Burst again. You can see the Reflect being consumed here. And that dealt 274,000 damage to the boss. I don't know if you guys saw it, but if you play back the video, you'll see the pop-up of 274,000 damage on the boss. And remember, because it's Tyrannical Key, if you reflect, this scales with Tyrannical. So this entire thing just rinses and repeat. I would say the biggest cause of death in Pucks is people don't use defensives, right? So you can see the Demon Hunter's blur is about to come up. I fully expect that if the fight lasts longer for him to basically use blur, and he pops meta now, um, I guess just to finish off the boss or something. But the rogue basically had cloak, um, and you can see the Demon Hunter popping blur on the first one. Very important, right? And the Druid used both bugs uh, to survive the entire boss. And I'm going to forward the footage here because I don't want to waste your time. It's just flying around, doing my little stuff. But I would say most people after they clear, uh, you can see Spell Reflex like absolutely like destroying the meters there, right? My top damage was Spell Reflect. And we fly over to the first area here. And, you know, initially, uh, I think when I first did the beta, nobody liked to pull this big pack here. So this pack here is like this giant patrol that patrols the area, right? And you know it's the giant one because like, well, it has the most of our units. Um, there's a few nifty things you can do with this pack, actually. Something you can do is actually to pull this with the Lance Master on Fortified Keys. And so you have two packs, right? And you Bloodlust, the first pack, uh, which I think is quite efficient. Um, sorry, I think we deleted the mob too quickly. So I'm going to rewind a little and talk about the pack. So... If you use my Plater profile, you know that there's only two things you need to care about. One is the Plane Stomper, who casts an AoE Fear, no matter what kick this. You can just assign one kick to it, one melee kick, sufficient to cover. Horn Sounder, it attempts to rally the mobs around it. And if the cast goes off, all of them go berserk, they enrage, do a lot of damage. And why is that dangerous? Look at this longbow. This longbow does a multi-shot that is a random aggro. It randomly just chooses whoever he wants or she wants or it wants to basically fire an arrow. If that thing is enraged on fortified, trust me, it's going to hurt. This is on Tyrannical 16, so like it doesn't seem like it's a big deal, but these things actually hurt. Um, and dodge swirlies on the ground. That's all I have to say, right? Um, so what I was trying to say earlier is that you can pull this one into the Lance Master and pop blood last and basically burn. That's one possible way to do it. Um, if you're new to this um, dungeon, you need to kill these three packs of Lance Masters in order to free the first boss. So whenever there's a Lance Master pack, you always kick the Lance Master, right? The fear. And you can see all these longbows just doing whatever shit they want, right? Like they're just randomly shooting people. And on fortified keys, again, this is the most dangerous part, which is why you can see like me using Shockwave. You want to try and just control the damage going out on people. Um, and you basically don't want any form of, um, you know, and basically like it can snowball very quickly, right? Due to bad RNG. You also notice that as a tank, um, the, the war spears dudes, like they'll put like some form of dot, stacking dot on you. So you need to be very careful when you pull these things. Um, the bleed does hurt on fortified. So you just need to be, you know, wary of that. Um, but I would say that the patrols here are actually very decent count on fortified weeks. Because this pack, in my opinion, is actually not as dangerous as uh, the second area, right? All those casters around the, the, the storm boss. And also the third area, um, those dudes on the hill, those are pretty dangerous too. These guys, as long as you control the horn sounder who rallies, the plane stomper that casts AoE fear that you need to interrupt, more or less you should be fine, right? AoE stuns on the longbows and you should be okay. So I'm going to forward the footage here because I don't want to waste your time, right? The mobs here, they just repeat and they essentially don't do much once you understand exactly what I said. Oh, the other thing I guess I should mention is 
Sometimes I see some pucks, they simply dash in to kill the Lance Masters first, as like the first pool in the zone. That's fine. But if you don't clear the patrol, sometimes the patrol is sneaking by the side and people butt pull the patrol. And I've seen this white many pucks. So as a tank, if you're leading a puck blind, I suggest you go and pull the patrol first. So people don't butt pull, um, you know, stuff. And like what they say, you know, the paranoid survive in the long run. And if you're a tank and you're paranoid in pucks, it probably will serve you well, like I am. Um, and I'm, I'm very paranoid by nature. I used to like want to check all the windows and the doors are locked before I sleep. Yes, I'm, I know I'm crazy, but yes, that's what happens. So you want to make sure that once you clear all the Lance Master, those three packs, you do the boss. And I think this is one of the easiest boss in the entire dungeon. So I'm going to play it on fast speed. And, and, and all, all it does is it spawns this ad, right? So I'll talk about it. Saboteur runs to uh, the planes and he's always running to one of the lances, one of the artillery uh, lances. So he's running to the boss um, and you want to slow stun this guy, ideally beside the hitbox of the boss so you can cleave the boss and the ad, right? Efficient damage. But where he's always running to is basically the artillery that you need to fire, the lance that you need to fire. He basically indicates where it is. As a tank, you want to make sure that you start dragging the boss towards the artillery because if your healer is a designated guy who basically interrupts the boss by throwing out the lance, you can see he runs over here to the right to cast the lance. Um, if he's out of range, he can't heal you, right? And if there's grievers, obviously he can't heal you. The boss was channeling eruption. If the boss gets eruption off, it's a wipe. So you need to lance the boss to interrupt the cast. That's basically it. And then he just rinses and repeat. He spawns an ad, we jump the ad, we kill the ad, move the boss towards the artillery. Uh, nifty trick is the artillery does 5% damage on top of stunning the boss. So that's something that um, you can do if let's say the boss is low, you just want to fire it, right? So you can see we fired it, interrupt its cast again. Again, another saboteur runs and you know, based on where it's running, you know it's this artillery. So I'm moving the boss over here. Very simple stuff, druids off to click when it's ready. Um, and then here he went to he wanted to convoke before he lances, which is fine. As long as the eruption doesn't go off, you're good. If the boss is low, like you know, a few percent, you can actually uh, root the ads uh, and just tunnel boss. It's possible as well. Uh, something I'll say about um, you know the ads is if you don't attend to them, right, they will end up destroying your lance. So it's a wipe, right? Because you can't interrupt the boss. So that's why you need to kill the ads just to make it a bit clearer. All right, so now we're heading to the third boss. And I would say that the third boss, everyone thought it was easy. And then Tyrannical Grievous and Bursting rolled around and everyone realized this boss is not easy at all. And I'll explain why. It's a, it's a tank heavy fight. Your tank needs to do the heavy lifting here. And uh, before that though, I'm getting here myself. We're actually going to talk about uh, the trash in this area first. So the trash in this area consists of um, all these mini bosses on top of like these hills, right? And they basically cast all of them. They cast Death Bolt Volley, which like the name suggests, Volley means a spell that hits everyone. So you want to kick that. Um, something that is dangerous on Fortified Week that's very important for you to know and you're about to see it happen is you can see there's these birds on top of me, the patrols. If you stand and fight on top of the hill, on the fortified weeks, the birds will aggro as they fly by. It's designed that way. That's why there are hills, right? So on fortified weeks, I would say it's a dangerous pool unless your party knows exactly what it's doing. So I would recommend if you're not sure, tag the mobs, drag them down the hill so you don't aggro the birds. Over here, we aggro the birds anyway. You can see it's just proximity aggro, right? The birds, they do this frontal. You can see there's a lot of shit to dodge. Frontals, frontals, green swirlies, right? It's dangerous. So what I recommend here is um, you just tag the birds as they fly by um, when it's safe to do so rather than letting the birds aggro onto you or at least be aware of the fact that the birds will aggro you on fortified and it's dangerous. This tyrannical, you know, it's not a big deal. You can see it's still one shot. My chamois, right? My chamois literally got one shot. You can see 200k of damage from the rotting winds. Tyrannical key, by the way. Um, so... Just be careful of that. You can see on this pack here, next we have this Corruptor, right? So 
I would say that in a pack like that, the Corruptor also needs to be kicked to control the damage um, that's going out on the party. Note that the Corruptor can be stunned, can be disoriented, um, etc, etc. The mini boss, however, the one that casts Volley, couldn't be disoriented or stunned. He will cast something called Shatter Soul, and the next cast, I'll slow down the footage maybe a little to show you. The mini bosses cast Shattered Soul, and um, as a non-tank, you need to look around for your soul. Like, where the hell is my soul, right? You need to pick it up. And um, that's basically the mechanic in all these uh, pulls here. I think he's about to cast it again. And obviously dodge swirlies, right? That's common sense. Um, again, another volley. I don't know if you'll cast it again, but if not, I'll show you on the next pull. Um, and yeah, he's, you see he cast Shattered Soul. He won't finish his cast, but basically... If you are a non-tank, you'll get targeted by this, you need to go pick up your soul, <laughs> else you can't function. So, done this, this hill here, I'm headed to the next hill. And there's two Corruptor packs here. So, again, stun, interrupt, make sure you have a kick rotation, and you should be okay. Um, but too much cast going off, dangerous on 4 to 5 weeks. Don't underestimate. You. It seems easy because it's tyrannical. Again, I'm stressing. On fortified keys, these things, they hurt. Right? By the way, as a warrior, you can spell reflect that. I'm just saying. Um, and also, at the same time, not only must you deal with all the cards, you need to pick up your souls because, like, you know, they fracture your soul and stuff. Um, I traditionally also like to pull all these um, ancillary mobs. Basically, because I'm sure all of you know now. Knockwood, the strat is to get 95% before you fly off to the final zone. And we'll talk about it later. But you want to pick up as much of your count as possible in the first zone, um, and as well as the third zone where we currently are. The Storm Elemental area, not much count to, that's efficient to pick up on. So I'll say get your count from the first and the third, which is what I'm doing now. Um, I'm going to forward here because nothing too special. Like you've seen the mobs, I explained it. Um, and we're heading to this, this other like hill here, right? Um, and again, nothing too special. Mini boss does stuff. Shatter soul. Pick up your soul. You can, you can see the soul. Did you guys see like the the the, the ghost um, looking like animation? And then people are running to run out to get their souls here. That's basically what they're doing essentially. Just pick up your soul and you're fine. Just run over it, right? Um, and that's pretty much it. Nothing too much to talk about. Oh, the warriors they put like you can see this mortal strength debuff. Let me rewind a little, sorry. I should have talked about it. You see these warriors here? These warriors, they put this like Mortal Strike debuff on you. You can see the cast earlier, right? So I get this Mortal Strike debuff on fortified keys. This thing is deadly because they last forever, right? They stack the Mortal Strike on you. And over time, you eventually cannot receive any heals from your healer or diminish heals. And that's why um, it sucks. So what I'm doing here is I'm flying to proc the RP, right? My idea is that if you look at the timer, I'm currently 2043. If I basically get a bloodlust here, it means that I get bloodlust for the final boss, right? So I'm trying to proc the RP. The moment you touch the the circumference, um, RP will start, and you see the dude start running down. You can see they're running down, starting to RP, and um, we save a bit of time, right? Because we don't want to wait long for RP here. So we're just killing this guy. Biz caller, you need to interrupt, and and you can see uh, he does this like roar thing that you just need to interrupt. One kick rotation, very simple. Nothing too serious. All right, so I'm just telling them now, like, please agree. How are you guys doing the wins on this boss? And they all want to spread, so we spread, right? But the most important thing about this boss is it's a tank-heavy fight. This seems like an easy fight, but it's not an easy fight, and I'll explain why. It all comes down to this ancestral born uh, thing that they have as a mechanic. You can see as the boss are far apart, they have this stacking buff called Ancestral Bonds. The further they are away, for, sorry, the longer they are away from one another, the more stacks of Ancestral Bond they get. And that empowers their abilities. And why is this dangerous? You see Tira here, she does a random quick shot on people. Random aggro table. It just randomly picks a target and fires quick shot. If you keep them like too far apart for too long, Tira gets too much stacks. She one shots. So you can see, even on like, removing Ancestral Bond, right? When um, the other dude walks close, the Demon Hunter takes sufficient, like, substantial damage. Even at a single stack or zero stacks of the buff, 
look at how much is chunking the chamois and the roll. So that's why as a tank, you want to quickly make sure that when Tira leaps away, you are already well positioned for Maruk to run in to cleanse the Ancestral Bond. Because the moment they are close, Ancestral Bond goes away. So I'm trying to get Ancestral Bond go to go away before Jojo here, the Druid, gets hit. You can see it's removed again. It goes out on Jojo, so it doesn't hurt as much. Maruk does brutalize, which needs an active mitigation from a tank, right? Shield of the Righteous and all these fancy full stuff that you guys have. Uh, Demon Spikes, for me, Shield Block. Uh, but brutalize absolutely trucks, um, especially if Ancestral Bond is up. But you can see, like, all Tira is doing is quick shot, quick shot until Gale Arrow. Gale Arrow is dangerous. What does Gale Arrow do? At each player's location, the, there will be tornadoes that basically spread out from each player's location except the tank. There's two ways to do this. One is, in my party, everyone decided to spread. My personal preference is not to spread, it's to stack. All five of us, we stack on the same spot. The tornadoes will all emit in the same direction and come back from afar into the same spot again. They'll converge on the same spot. And it's super safe if you stack because there's no instance of burst damage that you take um, from one another. So all I'm trying to tell you is that stacking is kind of safe, but we decide to spread, right? So you can see tornadoes are going out now. If you all stack together, let's say, let's imagine we all stacked here on the left. All our tornadoes basically go out in a very neat pattern and you wouldn't make any mistakes. To me, stacking is always the play. But sometimes people are just not used to stacking, right? Because your range likes to play in Narnia or Africa and they like to hit stuff from afar. So sometimes they don't like to run into to stack because like they lose DPS, right? Which is fine. As long as people don't get hit by tornadoes. This is way messier, right? But as long as you don't get hit, it's fine. Anyway, I know she's leaping. That's why you can see I pre-move Maruk. I know she's leaping. Immediately, I start bringing Maruk over there. You can see Ancestral Bond, one stack, right? From being far apart. But the moment Maruk's near, it's gone. This quick shot no longer is empowered. And still it does, you know, decent amount of damage. All right, next comes what I think is the most deadly part um, of this encounter, right? Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, like, obviously, like, move out the purple AoE, right? Sorry about the alarm clock. I was just setting up something um, to wake up on time. But let me continue here. Um, so this wins. Let me rewind a little. So you can see that Tira is doing a quick shot and Maruk is doing an earth splitter. And shortly after, Tira will channel this guardian win, which will basically push you back. The idea of this mechanic is, is trying to make it hard for you to deal with um, AoEs that will come out from the Earth Splitter. The Earth Splitter is a two-part combo, right? And the reason why this is dangerous is that when both of them are casting their stuff, they're channeling, they are far apart. There's a chance they are far apart, right? So you can see when I interrupt Tira, Tira immediately casts Quick Shot. She's stationary, she can't move. Meanwhile, Maruk is happily casting Earth Splitter, right? And it's an empowered Earth Splitter, by the way. And sorry, I just I got to hear myself. Let me just play that back again. So I interrupted. Maruk is casting Earth Splitter. And it's a two-part combo, like I told you guys. So there's two waves of Swordies, right? You can see they're far apart now. This is the problem. Maruk now has 10 stacks. Tira has 10 stacks. So this quick shot is going to truck 11 stacks, right? See how much damage the Druid takes. Look at this. Literally half the health. So what I did there is I instantly leapt over the AoE circles, which hurt, by the way, on Tyrannicals to try and position Maruk so that she's close to Tira. The moment Maruk is close, Tira's ancestral bond is gone. The shot's going back to hurt per normal. See, Dima Hunter takes just a bit of a slice of health. So this is the so-called difficult part of this fight. The tank needs to be smart enough to always move the boss so they don't get ancestral bond. A lot of guides, they skip over this, right? They just say, put the boss together. It sounds simple, but it's the little nuances like this that breaks your keys. And it's important that you guys understand. You do whatever it takes to bring uh, Maruk and Tira together as a tank. And the rest of the fight, rinses and repeats. I won't talk about that. I'll just fast forward here uh, because the, the rotations are, the rotational abilities are just spell queuing and it's basically the same, right? So again, you can see this thing, this important overlap again. Let me rewind here because it's the dangerous bit, right? You can see at this point in time, 
for some reason, Maruk decides to stop just before Tira. And so this, this Bond is stacking. See, four stacks. And we kick. After you kick, Maruk is still channeling. Can't move, right? So what I'm trying to do is, you can see, I basically notice there's a gap. So I move there. So the Maruk will follow me and to cleanse Ancestral Bond. And with that, it makes the quick shot a lot easier to deal with. Um, so that's what I wanted to highlight to you guys. It's very important. Other than that, this boss is pretty much um, straightforward. And then we have Gale Arrows again, do the Gales, yada yada. People almost die. I suggest pop a defensive at a point. Um, yeah, I definitely encourage people to pop a defensive on the Tornadoes actually. But some people like, they like to save the defensive for when they know that Tira is doing a quick shot. Again, you can see the same thing. 11 stacks. This is dangerous, right? Um, and it's just so bad RNG here. So you can see they're far apart. I couldn't bring Maru over close enough. And I wanted to basically, I was thinking of popping like a big defensive to leap across. And I can only cleanse it at 14 stacks, which is pretty bad. Ideally, you want, you want your range on your melee to bait the Earth Splitters far apart, the two waves far apart from one another. So you have a gap to stand in between to position Maruk, if that makes sense. Idea is try and do whatever it takes to bring Maruk close to Tira. Um, you can see I'm typing to the party, we need count here. I want to bore you because all these parts are repeatable. I've talked about all these things. If you use my plater, you know exactly which one to kick. These are easy count. Pull them, kick them, um, get to 95%. Um, you know, again, all these things, they don't do much, right? Like. Just, just kill stuff right? and get to 95%. Um, I guess the reason why you do 95%, let me talk about it now to save time, right? Later on in the dungeon, there is two mini bosses that you must fight before the final boss. I know there's a shenanigan where you can skip them with a rogue. You, know, do, you do some technology where the rogue pulls and vanish and stuff. I won't go into that. That's like advanced stuff, right? That I'll leave for one minute and plus tips. But... This is the time saver that everyone should know by now if you watch this channel. Um, if you look at the mini map here, you can fly to the left of the boss and you can land on this like this channeler dude and that will save you time. You are immediately at the boss's area already. This is the exact spot of the mini map. Screenshot that. Make sure you fly through the valley. If you don't fly through the valley, you're going to get knocked off. So it will save you so much time by just doing this skip. Skip to this area. And by the way, again, if you can't find it, it's on my channel, the Knockwood Skip. Just search YouTube for it. Um, and the moment you land, get on your normal mount and run towards the boss. Be careful of this patrol here. This patrol moves up, down, up, down. Don't drop and pull the patrol by mistake. Dangerous. All right, these are the two mini bosses you need to pull. Gonna forward here because they don't do much. Um, I'll just explain. But Tuck here does a kick that you must do, which is basically a, a fear, right? And then the Druid obviously decided to do the old skip, which is he'll jump through the fence. You can see he appears here, right? He's jumping through the fence on the left. You can see this, this little Druid. He's doing the old skip. It wastes so much time, right? Because by not flying, you're just wasting 30 seconds. Um, but Tuck does something that you need to kick as an AoE fear. Um, and what you want to try and do is you want to try and bait this dude, um, Balara, into the fence here. So what melee should be doing is they should be standing near the fence to bait this charge. You can see he's running away, right? And there's a chance that when he runs away, you accidentally pull the boss and stuff like that. That's why you want to bait the charge by standing near the fence so he runs into the wall. That way you get more melee uptime. Um, I'm going to forward here because he does nothing. Yeah, you can see like that's the right thing to do. You bait it into the fence. Obviously, don't pull the patrol. It's dangerous. Um, and then let me talk about the final boss. Um, this... On first sight, seems easy. And that's really because phase one, he does nothing much, right? I'll play at normal speed. Phase one, pull him. He hits the tank with rending strike. He does um, iron spear, which after iron spear, by the way, you spear a person. Where the person was speared is the direction he will start charging towards. And here's a mistake that um, a lot of people make. And I think I, I actually died to, oh no, I died. I didn't die to this, but I took damage from this which is the boss's hitbox is larger than this red circle seems. If you are in anywhere near the hitbox when he charges off, you're going to take trample damage. So you can see I got knocked off, right? Obviously, like I'm a tank, so it doesn't do much damage. And you can see like I have the, the cobalt proc on me. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But 
um, you don't want to be near the hitbox. That's what I'm trying to say. He does Savage Strike. He's got a heavy hit on the tank. Uh, Rending Strike puts a bleed on the tank. And then he does this like Kono, right? That you want to make sure that you spread. Oh, by the way, when he does this like Kono, you can see like you have like brown swirlies around you, very faint. It's kind of like quaking. Don't drop it on people, basically. Spread. Don't drop it on people. You take a lot of damage here, might want to pop a personal. But it's not a big deal in this phase. Not yet, anyway. Phase 2 is a monster. Phase 1, easy. Right, so you Savage Strike, you know, as a tank, you just mitigate. Make sure you got mitigations. Um, shortly after, the boss uh, will basically phase, right? You can see he phased at 60%. This is the important part. These ads, they absolutely frag on Tyrannical. They scale according to Tyrannical. You can see I'm basically kicking them in. And you can see uh, my party is also bringing all four ads in. It, in a part group where it's troublesome to coordinate kicks, what I actually suggest is for people to CC the ads. Um, maybe, for example, you CC the far right. You blind it or you trap it or you paralyze it. Idea is that way you don't have that many casts that is... Uh, you know, that you need to interrupt. But you can see how much the cast actually hurts. These are going off. You can see the cast is going out, right? You just look at the damage that the Shami was taking from the cast. You can see this going out again. You can see the Druid almost dies, right? So you actually need to stop them. And the Chaos Nova here was clutch. If that went out, he's dead. Um, so what I suggest is before you pull the boss, talk about how you're going to deal with this on tyrannical keys. Do we CC one of them, kill three of them? Uh, do we save all our cooldowns and bloodlust during the adds phase? That's one possible way as well. Um, in the second phase, the boss changes abilities. Uh, but before you get there, like I said, make sure you talk about how to do with the adds. Maybe you CC one of them, right? And then what's the kick rotation? Oh, I'm kicking the far left. You are kicking the far right. Make sure you assign. Boss goes into phase two. Um, and he does conductive strike followed by a thunder strike on the tank. You can see later on when I show you there's a conductive strike again. The healer needs to cleanse the debuff from the tank. If not, Thunder Strike is gonna like, you know, literally like you'll give your tank. By the way, as a warrior, you can reflect Thunder Strike, just saying. So you can reflect Thunder Strike, take no damage at all, fun times. Um, but the most dangerous ability is about to come here. P uh, this this uh this spear, right? So now it's changed to static spear and it deals more damage. Uh, the difference here is that when you get speared, you get pulled in. So one thing you should do is, if you're the being targeted, there's two things you need to do. Firstly, try and drop the spear so that the boss is facing a pillar. So he runs to the pillar and he doesn't run uh, to Africa, right? Because you lose downtime um, or rather uptime on the boss hitting the boss as melee. That's the first thing you do. The other thing you do is try and position the spear near the boss. That way your melee gets a bit more uptime and GCD to squeeze in a few more hits. And I got hit by that. So again, like again, the hitbox is big. When he spears you, you need to be fast to run. Um, and we'll see it again, right? Oh, this next one, cracking upheaval. Um, he does the same corner, but now you have these blue circles on you. Again, don't drop blue circles on people, but when it times out, you drop a puddle that you need to move out of ASAP. You can see like everyone is literally half health, right? It hurts. Move fast. Um, you can see the conductive strike. Okay, I'm going to play it back. Look at this conductive strike. This thing is casting. You see the moment it goes out, there's a debuff on me. Nine seconds. Healer needs to cleanse ASAP. It's now gone. Right, my healer is fast. Um, and then he'll do a spear again that you just need to be ready for. You can see the spear. And he should basically try and position it towards the wall, actually. Okay, I run out immediately, no chances taken. Um, and um, that's good, right? Naturally, you don't want to place it too close to the boss. Naturally, if it's too close to the boss, people won't have enough time to react and run away, right? You want to place it a certain distance away from the boss so people have a bit more time to get away from the boss before he tramples you to death. Other than that, pretty standard boss. It seems difficult, but it's not really difficult. It's just, you know, don't drop blue swirlies on people. Uh, move out blue swirlies. Uh, healer cleanse fast, make sure you have a plan for the ads, and you will be a-okay. Um, and that's pretty much it for knockout offensive. It seems difficult, it seems complex, the bosses seems intimidating, and rightfully so. I would say the second and the third boss, the 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 Storm Elemental and the, the, the Twins, right? Those are an absolute terror on, on high tyrannical, especially on Grievous. 
um, affixes. So hopefully this masterclass on knockout offensive gives you the confidence to park this key, to go into it and absolutely stomp in mythic class for fortified and tyrannical. If you found this guide helpful, do subscribe to the channel. More of these Mythic Plus masterclasses coming your way. I plan to make it for every single Mythic Plus dungeon. So stay subscribed for that. You don't want to miss that. I also stream on Twitch. Feel free to swing by to hang out. Good luck in your keystones. I will see you soon.